India launches a new PSLV rocket. New Horizons is getting closer to Pluto. Rocket Labs has chosen a new launch site. Philae is sending really cool data, and Zero is launching at night. So much cool stuff. Except I gotta go. I have a call right now, so I'll talk to you guys later. Tomorrow begins right now. Oh jeez. Welcome to tomorrow. <laughs> My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always the beautiful, wonderful, lovely, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham will be your host for this episode. This is episode 8.21 for July 11th, 2015. Now before we get started with space news, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed ten dollars or more to this specific episode. If you'd like to help crowdfund this show, you can grab more information on levels and rewards over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, let's get started with some happy, happy launch news. We have the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV, which took off Friday, July 10th at 1628 Coordinated Universal Time. Three, two, one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, lift off normal, plus five. Plus six, plus seven, plus eight, plus nine, plus three seven seconds. seconds. And if you can't tell, that is a DD exclusive, which they do in all of their footage. I'm not sure why. Uh, uh, there were five satellites aboard. Uh, a good chunk of them were to track uh, the expansion of Chinese cities. Uh, they're basically for um, um, helping and workflow and, and you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, but there was also a really cool demonstration new... Uh, uh, CubeSat on board that's designed to help kind of uh, deorbit satellites in a safe way hmm. so that uh, rather than turning into space junk and space debris it will go out to the satellite kind of unfurl its solar sail and then pull it back down into earth orbit and then allow it to break up in the atmosphere so you don't get more more and more and more space debris sitting up there uh, that's called deorbit sail uh, nice. this was the 30th flights of the polar satellite launch vehicle since 1993 and it took off from the, uh, and again, I'm terrible at pronouncing things, so I apologize, but it's the Satesh Dewan Space Center, which is on India's east coast. Uh, this was actually also an interesting little factoid. The largest payload that the PSLV has bought up at 1,440 kilograms, or 3,174 pounds. So nice. there you go. Congratulations to India for yet yeah. another successful launch. Very, very cool. Oh, you know, and uh, we don't have space mics, so I'm just going to awkwardly transition to myself. Uh, take it away, Ben. Oh, New Horizons. <laughs> there you go. We're about a week away, uh, a little under a week away at this point. For those who don't know, New Horizons, it is our first mission to the planet Pluto. Yes, I said planet Pluto. Deal with the people. And uh, this is what, here's a graphic of about where we're at right now. We kind of showed you a different graphic. Uh, once again, huge thank you to NASA for making these uh, scalable or, uh, vector graphics. And uh, yeah, we're getting we're getting really really close. So I think we're at what six days away, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, being uh, at Pluto at this uh, critical flyby moment. We actually have a. Um, I think we're uh, four days away at this point. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, it, it's it's really close. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's going to be epic. We also have pictures from Pluto because as we get closer, the resolution increases. And if you remember, like, like each show for the past few weeks, we've been giving you these picture updates. Some of them have been animated. Some of them have been not. But now you can actually see out uh, or see some basic geology on, well, you can see a lot more detail. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. A lot more detail on the planet Pluto. Uh, so it's real good. I'm super excited for this mission. This is going to be awesome. This when it actually flies cool. by Pluto. Oh, I, one thing we didn't mention. It's not. I, I apologize. I don't have any show notes for this. So I'm doing this totally from memory. But uh, right after we did our show last week. Yes. Like we got off the air. We're done. Like that was awesome. We're getting ready to go out to uh, Disney for dinner as we usually do after the show. And we get like there's this Twitter fury mm -hmm. of New Horizons has gone into safe mode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a software fault on New Horizons. Fortunately, like a day later or so, they got New Horizons operating again. But here's hoping that does not happen a week from now or a little less than a week from now when uh, when she uh, flies past Pluto. So ah, yeah, it's gonna be great. one chance at this. Been in space for like ten years. You get one chance at this. So, all right, there you go. All right, moving right along. Uh, talk to me about Rocket Labs. Uh, yeah, so Rocket Labs, as you may or may not recall from New Zealand, uh, is about to complete their launch site construction this year. I suppose I shouldn't say about to, but they're going to be completing their launch construction 
launch site construction this year. Goodness gracious. Okay, you so. You can do it. I believe in you. Man. It's it, just an internet show. I it's know, all right. right? So uh, they're going to be in New Zealand's South Island by the end of uh, 2015. They should be completing this. It's And again, forgive me for this one. I believe this is pronounced the Caterite Spit. It's about 20 miles south of Christchurch. K-A-I-T-O-R-E-T-E. <laughs> The, uh, the sure the launch pad they they're building the launch pad the rocket integration building fuel tanks and support facilities they uh, want to do three test launches starting in 2015 and then of course standing extending into 2013 or 26 oh my goodness well, it's gonna extend they're into starting 2013. in 2015 they're, they're also extending building into time 2016 machine. goodness gracious they already have about 30 customers which is really cool and if that uh, particular rocket looks a little bit tiny for scale you can see this sort of pickup truck right down there next to it this particular rocket is designed very specifically to launch microsatellites as a dedicated uh a dedicated launch vehicle for microsatellites so people who want to put their spacecraft into space don't have to rely on being the secondary payload or secondary passengers on bigger rockets. I thought they went for nanosets. Did they have to downscale it to microsets? They're, well, they're doing nano, they're doing micro, they're doing all the little ones. The little, but they'll do nanosats too, right? That's my understanding. Nan nanos yeah. are bigger than micros. Yeah, so okay. uh, the rocket's about 1 meter, 3.3 feet in diameter, stands about 20 feet tall, or, or 20 meters, 66 feet tall, uh, designed to bring up a 100 kilogram or 220 pound satellite into orbit. Uh, 500 kilometers or 310 miles above Earth. That was a lot of numbers. Uh, the They're looking to launch the rocket at 4.9 million per flight, which is really cool. And they want to have the ability to fly once per week. So it's kind of like uh, kinda back, back in the day when uh, SpaceX had the Falcon 1. It's kind of mm -hmm. like that, but a little less expensive. Yeah, and I, I wanted to point out really quickly that the company elected to design an expendable rocket after deciding a reusable booster would be too expensive to refurbish. I thought that was kind of interesting. Considering that they're doing a lot of stuff that's uh, 3D printed, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Somehow I didn't have that. And they're doing yet. a carbon a carbon composites um, vehicle. The whole thing's carbon composites, which yeah. is hard to do with cryogenic fuels. So uh, that's going to be a pretty big deal, yeah. too. So All the looks 3D printed much. engines, um, carbon composites, uh, tanks, uh, and they can crank these things out. They're designed to be able to just really make them really fast and mm -hmm. then you know, drop them on the launch pad. We actually did an interview with the CEO of Rocket Labs Limited uh, earlier, I think it was this year or last year, but if you search for TMRO Rocket Labs, you'll be able to find that interview. And it was a really fascinating interview talking about the, some of the challenges of carbon composites and uh, their engines and how they're trying to do what they're trying to do. Hopefully we'll be That's able to bring cool. them back on. Uh, we'll wait for them, I think, to get their launch site up and yeah. running yeah. and kind of like right before they're ready to launch. Let's get them into a phase where they're like, they're right on the cusp and we'll bring them back on and, and see what some of the challenges were that they did didn't anticipate. Yeah. I think that'll be a fun interview. Be very cool. All right, moving right along. Filet has communicated with Rosetta again. Now, we actually do have a live picture from space right there. There you go. There's Filet communicating back. With email. Rosetta. Email <laughs> and Twitter. Filet is emailing, tweeting, tweeting, tweeting. Rosetta. Uh, this happened on July 9th from 1745 to 1807, coordinated universal time. Uh, it was, they actually got data back from CONCERT, which is the uh, Comet Nucleus Sounding Experiment by Radio Wave Transmission Instrument also known as a backronym. They clearly wanted to call it well, concert. Um, now, the interesting thing is, it was kind of, it was expected but unexpected. They had actually sent the command to send concert on, or to turn concert on, mm -hmm. on July 5th, and then heard nothing, <laughs> nada, up until uh, July 9th. They don't actually know why they heard nothing until July 9th, so they're still kind of scratching their heads on that one. But they did get data back. Now, it was only back for, what was that? Well, that's like, what, 12 minutes, something like that? Mm -hmm. Uh, so not a very long time, but it's, it's very promising. Uh, they also believe that the uh, core temperature of Philae is actually up to zero degrees now. Uh, so that's, that's also uh, Celsius, sorry, zero degrees Celsius. So that's also promising. That's the temperature in which they believe that uh, Philae can charge its batteries. Once the batteries are charged, then it doesn't matter anymore. You can actually just do science at that point. The, the batteries can kind of do their do thing. Science. Do science. Science! So, uh, yes, very promising. Uh, we, again, we don't know why it didn't communicate. We did only get a little burst of information, but it, it does show that at least the, the lander is kind of still clinging on to life, there as it go. were. So, yeah, yeah, that's going uh, to be exciting. Hopefully they can bring it back online shortly. Yeah, that'll be very, very cool. And then this uh, was tweeted out in a, a little Vine clip. Check oh, yeah, this, you've got to see this. Check this out. Okay, the audio is our fault, but uh, yeah, what's uh? So that would be Mastin Space Systems Zero X 
A E R O zero, right? Yep. Uh, nighttime qual test, which is very, very cool. So Mass and Space Systems, a good friend of the show tomorrow, uh, has been doing all these different testing things. Uh, testing things. Oh my goodness, you're gonna have to help me out on this one. Apparently, this is gonna be fun. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they've been they've been testing stuff as you know as they do and. Um, uh, that looked, I think, I just thought it was a gorgeous clip, first off. It is. It's a really uh, awesome vine. Well, so I didn't know that they were on vine, so that's and, very cool. And Mastin has a tendency to kind of go into hiber hibernation mode for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So do we. Yes! I think, uh, hibernation I think, mode. I think Activate. we have it. There you go. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So it just, it looks nice. Uh, they have a tendency to kind of, well, when I say hibernation mode, I mean marketing hibernation mode. Mastin's always, always doing, doing something. Always doing something. But you don't always know what they're doing. There so you you're kind of, you know off in the background doing something and once in a while you get a really cool clip like that. So we're excited to see what they're doing. They got some DARPA contracts going on. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of really great things and I'm, I'm hoping that we get to see more interesting and cool things like that in the future. All right, let's go ahead and take a quick break and look at that, uh, com that uh, commercial slate again. And when we come back, our main topic, should we go to the moon or Mars first? Stay tuned, we'll be right back. And welcome back to the show. As you saw in that uh, little commercial break, those are now powered by Launch Library. We do have a yeah. few slots left. If you head on over to reddit.com slash r slash launch library, you can actually see a list of available slots. I think there are like three remaining. And we've got well over a dozen people working on the Launch Library, keeping this database of uh, stuff up to date. The reason this is cool is we offer it as a free API for developers. So if you're a developer who wants to build an application on maybe an Apple Watch, uh, the Moto, or what was the Android version of that? Android Wear? Android Wear, I think it is. iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, if they're still going to make that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, computers, whatever you want. Maybe it's uh, Google Glass if you feel like it for some odd reason. If you want to build an application based on this launch database that we try to keep up to date and make it the freshest, most up-to-date database, uh, hopefully in the world, uh, that is available to you for free. And it is these uh, librarians that, these volunteer librarians that help keep that data up to date. And if you're interested in, in uh, volunteering to become a librarian, <laughs> It's me too, apparently. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin at tmro.tv. Or if you're interested to develop against it, that's also free. Scroll to the bottom. There's a little link, tiny text, bottom right-hand corner. Gives you the instructions. Otherwise, uh, for, for more information, Benjamin at tmro.tv. Now, before we get into our main topic of Mars or Moon first, a huge shout-out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. The list got a little bit longer this week, so thank you, everyone, for making that happen. Once again, and if you'd like to learn more about the crowdfunding levels, you can head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO, where a crowdfunded show, every single dollar helps. So I tweeted out before the show, mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, we're going to talk about the moon next or Mars next. And uh, I have never seen Twitter responses this fast. Not just Twitter responses, but our chat room is blowing up right about it's now. It's such this a passionate crazy. topic. And I, I will say, uh, uh, up front, in the very beginning of the show, doesn't matter. As long as we're going to the moon or to Mars, as long as we're advancing forward, it doesn't really matter what we do first. Mm -hmm. So we just need to do something first, be it the moon or Mars. I think, generally speaking, most of the Tomorrow Camp is in the moon first ca camp. I just used camp twice. All right. Uh, mo sure. We're all kind of in that moon first. And then I think that mostly happened for a lot of us when we had, interestingly enough, Dave Mastin on the show. Mm -hmm. He was wearing his moon first shirt mm -hmm. and, and talking about, um, you know, why the moon makes sense. Uh, you know, let's go over some of the comments you guys had before the show. Just, this is like from 30 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> so let's start with the first one. Go ahead. Uh, this one comes from Professor Edwin Gorey saying, a moon base would be an ideal place to prepare a journey to Mars. We should have been there years ago. Yeah, so well, we were, actually we were there years ago. We were there like 40 some odd years ago. I think the intent is to say we should have established ourselves there years ago. And I think that's the key is because we say moon first or Mars first. Um, 
uh, yeah, well, we'll get that get to that in a minute. But yeah, it's it's about establishing a permanent settlement on these uh, alien right. bodies. We don't want to just go back to the moon and do more flags and footprints, right? We want to go back there. We want to stay there. And if if humanity, if we want to make a backup of humanity, we cannot do that on the moon. The moon is too close to Earth. It's too tied to our our system here. So we really do need to move it off to Mars. And ultimately, we need to go even further out than Mars. But Mars is a good stepping st first stepping stone. But the question is, do you go from Earth straight to Mars? Do you do a Mars direct kind of plan? Or do you use the moon? And you can use the moon as a refueling station, right? Mm -hmm. So you can refuel on the moon. Um, well, kind of, we've got tons of water on the moon. So you can use it as a method to you know, kind of cycle up there. It's really easy. Stuff like that. So uh, uh, Twicket had another interesting comment. And to it, it said, it's not what I hate about the moon first, Mars first shirts. We already went to the moon, so they're just stating a fact. Hashtag tomorrow, hashtag Mars next. Yeah, so that was kind of what I was alluding to a second ago. The, I think the, the difference is that we're talking about um, our next steps. Do mm -hmm. we go to the moon first for our next step, or do we go to Mars first for our next step? Well, Icarus Factor in the chat room has a kind of response to that, saying, moon is not a planet. Mars first planet. Yes, but how do you get to Mars? Do you get to Mars going direct or do you use the moon as a launching post? There are many advantages of that. First off is it's only three days away. Only three days away. So if something goes wrong, you're still within the time frame in which it is survivable. Mm -hmm. If we need proof of this, see Apollo 13. Right? <laughs> if sure, things go sure, wrong, right? you're, it's still a survivable journey at that point. Uh, we don't know, we haven't been out in that, that deep into space. Humans have not been that deep into space since 1972. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of stuff that we've forgotten. And trying to go from here straight to Mars might be harder than we think it is. Mm. So that's kind of the... And then also, the moon has water, which means we can use that to turn it into rocket fuels. So we can you know, expend the fuel to get to the moon mm -hmm. and then fuel it back up and use that to get to Mars, potentially even faster than if we were to try to go directly because now you've got a fully fueled vehicle ready to go. Interesting. So reasons for the moon. Uh, other comments from the... Uh, actually, Jared had, uh, for also from Twitter, if you don't mind moving on to the next slate, had an interesting point about that saying, moon first, that 72-hour direct abort capability will allow us to make mistakes because a Mars mission demands near perfection. So does a moon mission. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I think to your point saying that you're still within that, that window of, yep. you know. It's kind of six days, you know, three there, three back kind of thing. Right, 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 right. Whereas, you know, you kind of screw that up uh, on your way to Mars. You could be completely SOL. Oh, you got, ye it's a years, right, at that point. Right. Because right? you got to wait for a planetary alignment. So even if you get there and say, so you get there quickly and you get there in three months, you still have to wait for the planets to come back into alignment before you can come back. So mm -hmm. you're there, it's a multi-year round trip journey no matter what you do. Right, there's no uh, Apollo 8 situation with Mars? Not really, you, it's, it's, you know, you kinda <laughs> Can't could. Can't go up, come back and. You kinda could, I think, um, I think someone was planning that. There's a really interesting trajectory you can take to kind of make that happen, mm. but I don't think that would be the normal way to get to Mars. The flip side of this is, Going to the moon, there's not a whole lot of parallels between the moon and Mars, right? You have the regolith on the moon is very different than the soil and what you're going to deal with on Mars. Okay. There's wind on Mars. It's mm. really thin and light and raspy, not that, but there is wind there. Uh, there's a different amount of sunlight. There's basically a different amount of everything on Mars. So a lot of the lessons you learn on the moon will not translate to Mars. So why waste your time on the moon? Why not just go Mars direct? As someone in the chat room said, like you said, Mars is a planetary body. We've right. never been to another planet. We've never put humans on another planetary body. We put them on an alien pl body, but never in another planetary body. So can, can we inspire the same way going to the moon versus Mars? Right. Uh, Inspiration Mars was the... Uh, uh, that's what I was thinking. That's of. what you were talking about. Tito. Thank you, Mars. Dennis Tito, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark, in the chat room for for that particular one. Now, you have an interesting pro moon concept as well. I was talking about uh, you know inspiration. Mm -hmm. What's your pro moon? Uh, I, why am I drawing a blank right now? Well, it's the whole looking up. 
Oh, yes. Okay. So, I yes. Was trying to feed it to her subtly. I apologize. I wasn't and subtle enough. I was like, really? I, I, was, I do? I said something <laughs> smart once. That can't possibly be right. Uh, the, the general idea being that, uh, so we, Ben and I, live here in California. We do. And most of our family, our, our parents, our brothers, and whatnot, live in Minnesota. They do. It does not matter the tallest peak in California, I still cannot see Minnesota from California. It's, it's, it's impossible. I, I can't do it. However, no matter where I am in California, wherever, where my family is in Minnesota, if it's nighttime, we can look up and both see the moon. And so there was a really cute sort of uh, uh, movie at one point with lyrics to a song saying, like, we're under the same moon or something along those lines. And the, I, that, that's what kind of struck me was that no matter where you are on Earth, assuming it's a, not a completely cloudy night, you could look up and see the moon and you have it, that sort of connection to it because you can see it. And so if your family is there or your friends are there or there's a really spectacular hotel there, you can see it every single night and think, I have that connection. I, I, it, there's just something very visceral But you can me. look up and see Mars too. Sometimes you can, absolutely. Well, and sometimes, sometimes you can't see the moon. Right, but I mean, sometimes you can, sometimes you can. Sometimes it looks like a star, and sometimes you don't know what you're looking at. And sometimes... Uh, but it, everyone knows what the moon is? But you look up and you see the moon. It's, it's one of the most recognizable things. The other dangerous thing about going to the moon, though, is that we could go to the moon and we could kind of almost pull a reverse... We, we could pull a space station, I guess, where you get stuck there. Sure. Right? So you go to the moon, you're like, ah, we've done this now. And that's what you do. That becomes your new mission is the moon. And you forget Mars. And right. I think it's important to not forget Mars. And then also not to forget that Mars is the first stepping stone. Right. Right? There's like a point, potential point five with the moon, but then the first real stepping stone is Mars. It is not the last stepping stone. Right. It's just the first in the continuation of our multiplanetary journey. And I, I think it's easy to sometimes lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. Now... The second stepping stone may not happen in our lifetime. I, I firmly believe that in our lifetime, mm -hmm. we will have humans on Mars. I think that's really exciting and really cool. The question is, will we also have humans on the moon? And can you do both concurrently? Interesting. Right? Can you work on your moon program and your Mars program at the same time and have enough funding for both? Sure, but you say your. You're, you're making the assumption that these All same... humanity. Sure. Oh, all right. Well, then all of humanity, Yes. But will they? I, will, I guess will they? The I... answer is always yes. You can. Obviously, you can. We could go to the moon right now if we wanted. Mm, that's true-ish. That's it's mostly true. true. It's mostly... That has a true a hint of truthiness to it. But <laughs> yes. you get the idea. The, the, the fundamental concept is tr truthing enough. Uh, so then, it's it's just a decision to go right. right. So. Would we make the decision to both have a moon base and a Mars base? Or if we go to the moon first, will that steal our ability to go to Mars because of the amount of finances and money and resources it will take to go to the moon? No, I don't think so. No. How's that? Boom, I was shut down. <laughs> yep, there just you like go. Just like that. Just like that. See how easy that was? You just tell Ben no. <laughs> All right, we had other comments. <laughs> uh, what else do we have? Uh, this one comes from a grutter 87 alex says, I agree, and uh, this is in reference to, to Wicket and Jared Head. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah just, which is the uh, going to the moon first, 72-hour direct abort capability. Yes, it says, I agree, and I think it's essential to regular trips to Mars. Using it for refining refueling would reduce costs. Yeah, so actually making going to Mars by using the moon first could reduce your long-term costs, but it will make your short-term upfront costs substantially higher. Because now you need infrastructure here. Right. You need infrastructure on the moon. Right. And you have to have all of that working and producing stuff before you can even begin to start sending stuff to Mars. Yeah. So, so as opposed to for not doing the moon, you just need infrastructure here. And right. that's it. Right? Because then you just start sending that infrastructure to Mars. I, I do like this very next comment, though, which I think is kind of funny and very well-timed at this point, uh, from SAP Lancer. Or S A P L answer. It's hard to tell. Uh, it says, well, alternately, we could all just stay here on Earth and continue debating this question. Maybe that would be productive. <laughs> no, no, it is. It is a fun thought experiment. Uh, but I know that there are a lot of people in the Tomorrow community or the community of Tomorrow that actually do work in aerospace and do help to make these decisions. And actually, I'm curious which, uh, what your comments and ideas are, and what you think uh, will actually happen, whether you work in aerospace or not. 
as a citizen of tomorrow, leave your comments on YouTube, leave them on Facebook, on wherever, and let me, you know, should we go to the moon first and use that as a stepping stone to Mars, or should we just go straight to Mars? And why? Why or why not? And obviously, debate the idea, not the people, right? So don't, don't, right. don't, and, and the community of tomorrow is very good about that, but you can debate ideas just fine, just don't, just don't knock people individually. Right. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'm actually really curious to see what you say. Um, Space Mike, we actually have you in. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, moon or Mars first, Space Mike? Uh, uh, yeah, and, you know, I'm kind of like you where I think that we should do both. And uh, something that you brought up earlier is can we do both at the same time? I think that we can in certain areas. Like we can for the rockets that we would need to take, you know, all of our hardware to both of those places. We can, you know, somewhat for the suits that the astronauts would be wearing. Uh, we can somewhat for uh, some of the landing systems to take some of these habitats down to both of those surfaces. But then from there, the protection that those habitats would need and even the spacesuits and, you know, because they're two totally different environments, that's where things would start to, you know, change and kind of branch off into two separate programs. But I think a lot of stuff could be achieved with some hardware, the same hardware for both destinations. And uh, that is kind of something that uh, NASA has already been doing with the space launch system. You know, uh, we talked about, uh, briefly mentioned really, the J2X engine is no longer being worked on because they're not planning on using that engine until they are ready to start going to Mars. And, you know, personally, I think it's a waste of money because they're just going to have to spend a whole bunch to bring it out of mothball and start testing it again and make sure that it's up to spec and everything like that. But that's that's a whole another story. But the whole point of that, though, is that the space launch system would be evolvable to the point that when they're ready to start going to Mars, they just swap out the different sort of upper stage and would be enabled to do that. So I think they already have that sort of mindset of if we get approval to do either one you know we're ready to do both so that's what, what i think what would you do though i mean yeah so that that's that's neat that they can do either or but all things being equal you can do anything you want you're the administrator of nasa now what do you do do you do you build infrastructure on the moon and use it to launch to mars with the end goal obviously being mars so with the end goal of mars in mind do you go straight from earth to mars or do you use moon as a stopgap in between um i I would I would use the moon as a stopgap in between and I say that because of mainly just because of resources that potentially could be harvested from the moon, namely water, um, that could easily be sent from the moon to Mars. And certain resources would be harder to send from the Earth to some sort of imaginary Mars base than it would be from, you know, if you've already been harvesting it and collecting it at some sort of moon base. And just the experience of being able to operate a, a base on the moon, you know, even though, like you said, they are completely different environments and, and requirements and qualifications for each one it still would give you know the operators experience of being able to a keep humans alive at that base and be have it be a productive place so i think that we should do both and use the moon as a stopgap to get to mars awesome all right i think uh, any other final comments in the chat room that i missed uh, uh, there was actually one that you would like but i'm it's pretty far back now uh to, to wicked said that the pitch for nasa should be are you a red-blooded american then why would you want to visit a gray moon mars next <laughs> which is kind of hilarious just in and of itself yeah the chat room is just crazy pans going back and forth and this that and the other um of course somebody pointed out that this is a trick question from ben because obviously he chooses both uh, and actually, that is the final comment. I did leave this for last. Uh, Eng student uh, knows me well, which is all of the above. Uh, I do obviously when given two choices, I choose them both. So uh, I, I do agree. I choose them both, uh, both the moon and Mars. I think they each have uh, their set of pros and cons. Now, whether we go from here straight to Mars, or from here to the moon to Mars. Um, or from here to the moon and from here to Mars, uh, independent thing. I don't think it really matters. I think we need to do the moon and we need to do Mars. Uh, we eventually need to have humans concurrently on both of them. Mm -hmm. What we do next, what our next step is, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, you know, I could argue both sides, I think. I could argue for the pros of going to the moon first and the pros of going to Mars first. And I think the architecture isn't quite there for figuring out Mars uh, to actually make a... Um, an intelligent enough decision as to what the correct plan would be mm -hmm. 
because you don't really know what you actually need on Mars yet, which I think will dictate the mass that you need to bring up. You know a lot sure, of what sure. you know a lot of it. You have a, you have like 85, 90 percent of the picture right now. Mm -hmm. That last 10 percent is a big deal, though. So I, I I don't think we have all of the data quite yet, and um, that I think will also dictate whether we go to the moon use that as a launching point towards Mars, or we just go straight to Mars. I, I will say very quickly, there is one uh, singular voice in the chat room that is... One singular chat room voice. That is uh, advocating for Venus. Venus. Well, the, the sky surfing in Venus. That's a real thing. That, well, that, that's a real thing. Sure, until you get down to the bottom and you burn up, but that's cool. Well, no, no, you skip in the clouds of Venus. Yeah, no, no. Bring, give, give me space, Mike. Mike, what was your comment? To the bottom, you want to have uh, floating sky cities. I yeah. mean, the atmosphere is extremely thick. Did you know that the atmosphere as Venus has the same density as water? We literally could float stuff at the top layer of Venus's atmosphere, and temperatures there is not bad. It's a nice 70 degrees Celsius, so not too bad. So, yeah. well, I mean, yeah, that's still pretty hot, but, you know. Well, not not as hot as the surface and or yeah. other places. Or I the mean, the same pressure. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. and the same pressure. That's 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 key and kind of critical. Yes, that You yes, wouldn't be I'll able to much. go outside per se. I mean, you would you're you you wouldn't boil away, but <laughs> you you know, still it, it, it's easier you just Martian boats, sky boats, Martian Venus sky boats. boats? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Venus. We're on planet. We're, uh, on that yeah. note, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, leave your comments. Uh, we'd love to know what you think. Moon first, Mars first, or something else entirely. What do you think? How do we get humans on Mars How do we, in the best way? Do we use the moon? Do we use Mars? What, what, whatever you think. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into comments from last week's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode. Now, these people are also going to get a copy of After Dark as soon as it's available. You also get access, you get your name in the show, obviously, and you get access to our Google Hangouts. Oh, but wait, there's more. There are more reward levels. We also have our patron uh, subscribers. These are people who have contributed one penny up to $2.49. So as little as one penny gets your name in the show. And as we've mentioned before, time and time again, every single penny helps. We're a crowdfunded show. So uh, for more information, you can head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. We love those Patreon guys. They make our life so much better. It's way better than before when we had Epic and whatnot. It helps pay for cool set lights and plants that people have a love-hate relationship with and uh, cool set pieces in the front, and LED lights in front of us, and stuff like that. So, all right, let's go ahead and get co started with comments from last week's show. What's first up? This one comes from Brandon Markoff of Reddit. Hi, Brandon. So, did I miss something? Ellington Field, 10th Spaceport, Astronaut Training Vehicle Manufacturer, rah, rah, for HTHL vehicles that don't exist. That's Is there horizontal anybody... Horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing. I was gonna get there. Can I finish the comment, please? Yeah! Is there anybody out there actually planning on making such a vehicle? I would say there are tons of people out there planning on... Space Mike, name one person doing a uh, horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing vehicle. Uh, reaction engines. Me. Good. Great, there. <laughs> <laughs> me? <laughs> uh, Cheater! <laughs> uh, oh, you don't have to mute him. Uh, so, then we've also got... Uh, we've also got um, uh, <laughs> Spaceship Two, oh, uh, Spaceship Two, Christ. White Knight Two, Virgin uh, Virgin Galactic. Yep. You get to pick one. Uh, isn't Blue Origin? Aren't they? Oh no, 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 no not vertical. Blue Origin. I'm sorry. Uh, the other one. X, uh, X Core. Yeah, X Core. Thank you, Links. <laughs> there you go. There's three. You know, 
in that picture too was uh, the uh, Lockheed uh, 101 Star Chaser that Orbital ATK uses to drop their Pegasus rockets from. So that I think that confused a lot of people with that picture of Ellington Field. And then there's that futuristic vehicle that nobody knows what that is. So. But the point is, there are a ton of vehicles under production right now that are horizontal to horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing. That's a lot of words, horizontal in a row. Uh, that would work at, at that spaceport. Now, yeah. the thing is, do we have enough for 10 spaceports in America? Probably not. Not today. But hopefully someday, right? I mean, we, how, I have no idea how many airports we have in America, but wouldn't it be cool if we got to that same kind of level of needing that much infrastructure for our space commuting needs? That would be awesome. And I can see a day where that would happen. At the moment, everybody can have their own. Everyone can have... That's right. Virgin America or Virgin Galactic can have their own uh, spaceport. Yep. x Corps can have their... Uh, they can each have two. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. I think that there should be a different class of spaceport. Like, there should be, like, main spaceports, and then everybody else can have a spaceport, too, but they would be classified like a white sands. You know, they'd be an emergency spaceport when they're off course or something. A testing spaceport. Yeah, but wouldn't you be able to, for most of these vehicles, use a regular traditional airport as a landing? I mean, you do. You could potentially have some hazardous materials on there that an airport's not ready to deal with, like hypergolics and whatnot. Sure. But um, you could. You st if you're trying to save lives, you probably that's fine. You just you shut down the airport and you deal with it right. after you've landed and you've saved the lives. So, all right. Next up from James Hark. I'm sorry, Jack Harkness, as you once said in the past. because <sighs> Harkness, come on, from that's not James even. From James Harkness. It's not even my fault. You can't blame me. On the YouTubes. James Harkness from YouTube says, Plants, aquariums, and anything else not space-related or even simply modern in design clashes distastefully with your set. Oh. They all just look horribly out of place. Love you guys. Yes, I knew you were going to say it like that. <laughs> totally disagree. So, I mean, yes, but um, plants are absolutely required for space travel. We're going to need them for two things. Uh, well, more than two things, but two primary things. One, oxygenation, and two, chances are the future colonists that go to Mars, those first colonists, they're going to need to be vegetarian. So there you go. They're going to need so to bring plants. So need really, to bring we plants. should be like lemon trees and uh, asparagus. That's what we should have back here. That is true, but we both know we're going to kill that after like one week. Well, so yeah. we have plants that we're not going to kill to uh, kind of, uh, what am I trying to say? Give the illusion of plants that you would actually be bringing into space. But these, I mean, really, you do, for these long travel, long journey things, you're going to need plants. You can't not have them. They should really just be cacti. <laughs> and they look cool. It looks like. They do look cool. You know, it's, I like actually, them. it's funny. If you go to YouTube, there are the, the, it's polarized whether they like the plants or don't like yeah. the plants. Some people are like, no, I actually really like them. I'm excited to see them grow. I got one, like, right. Right here, right? So I just need to... Wow. Like right yeah, there. definitely there move go. that way. So I'll That's just, you know, best. I'll do the rest of the show like That's this. That's attractive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? So uh, they're excited to see them grow. And other people are like, no, they look tacky and horrible. I will say that they're, we haven't actually potted them yet. So they're yeah, still we in need there. to put them in something. We haven't yeah. found them. Like, we haven't figured that part out yet. But yeah, hopefully you, you guys, guys like the rest of the set. Go ahead, Mike. You guys should put them in like a non-functioning, futuristic-looking hydroponics bay or something. That would maybe we're. I, like I love the non-functioning hydroponics bay. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> maybe that's what this set is trying to emulate is a non-functioning hydroponics bay. That's what the blue is. That's what the blue is. It's running water. No. no Moving right along. No. Craig Hare from oh YouTube. Oh my goodness. Also from YouTube says, following on Jack Vidstar's comment, do you think that SLS should also be canceled just as Constellation was? I do. Oh, I'm waiting for you to do the acronym. What? What acronym? The Space Launch System. Oh. Uh, yeah, there you go. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. My bad. Also, go back to that image. What kind of icon is that? I don't know. Well, it's hair. It's, it's creepy. Craig, it's Craig's hair. It's Craig's, Craig hair. It is Craig's hair. Craig's hair. It's, he's very aerodynamic. All right. Yeah, he is. Uh, <laughs> so um, do I think the Space Launch System should also be canceled? I think the time to cancel the Space Launch System was a while ago. Yeah. We're so far in at this point that I'm not sure what the advantage... I think we're still paying for canceling the con Constellation program. <laughs> there are certain things that we're still paying to spin down. I'm not sure if that's actually still true, so take, take that with a grain of salt. But I know it took us a while to actually pay everything off and, and spin that whole program down. I would hate to do that again with SLS and then change course again and then have someone say, yeah, but you need to build another big rocket. 
So right. if we're going to cancel SLS, we need to stop the idea that NASA is building big rockets. And I'm not sure that Americans are ready for that yet. No. Whether it's right or wrong, I just I'm not sure that Americans are ready for NASA not to own the rocket. I think that every you know Apollo and space shuttle are so entrenched on us that the very idea that NASA wouldn't have their own vehicle, we just can't fathom. Even though they're pretty much the only government agency that makes their own vehicle. Yeah. Right? The FAA, they don't really make airplanes. Yeah. I guess the military, they make airplanes and they make vehicles, right? They, they make naval ships, but they're, all right, they're the non... Okay. No, the, all, all of the military's vehicles are contracted out. Well, technically so is SLS. Right? Mm. Yeah. Bare, so, barely. Yeah. All right. So I, I think we're past the point of canceling it. And right. um, we, we should build it at this point. We should launch it and we should fly it. And then once we've launched that test article, now we need to figure out how to greatly reduce its insane, crazy per launch cost. Okay. That's what we need to do next. Uh, so that we can actually use it. Because we do need these super heavy lift vehicles. If we're going to put humans on Mars and put humans on the moon, and we even want to have the talk about Mars or moon versus Mars first. If we want to do that, we need these really big vehicles. We need really big vehicles. Nine million electron rockets taking one nanosat worth of stuff up to the moon at a time. While probably technically possible, uh, I'd have to actually see if it can make it all the way up there. Mm -hmm. may not be. may actually not be technically possible. Boy, would that suck. Right? You want to yeah. have as much of that stuff, like, in big chunks sent up there as you can all at once. Yeah. Uh, Space yeah. Mike, while we got you, any comments on that? Amen. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Now, just so you know, I'm giving you a quick heads up. We'll have a show next week at our normal time, and then the week after that, we are going back to Minnesota, our hometown, don't you know, you betcha. Uh, for a wedding so we will be out two weeks from now so one more show and then we're out for one or two weeks do you remember i don't remember, I don't remember. we're either gone for one or two weeks we're not actually sure how long how, i don't know if we come back that friday and we can do the saturday show or if we come back saturday at which point we won't be able to do a saturday show we'll let you know though so follow our twitter account over at twitter.com slash tmro i'd like to thank everyone so much for watching if you're watching live after dark is up next otherwise if you're a patreon plus subscriber that'll be available on patreon shortly and for everyone else it'll be available in weeks have a great one